Hello again, it's me. I'm Jen, your licensed physician um, and fellow, you know, depression and depression sufferer. I haven't been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, but I have a lot of um, drama-based stuff and a lot of anxiety in everyday life anyway. Um, and the treatment that I want to talk with you about today should be good for both of us, both for your anxiety and my depression. Um, and I'm excited because I found a of studies I can read off to you. Um, so, uh, yeah, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm sorry. Look, um, I think we can, we can find stuff. There's always, until you have read every study on the planet and tried every single thing, you cannot give up. You cannot say that you've tried everything. Because you haven't read every study on the planet, you don't know what kind of stuff is out there that even your therapist doesn't know about yet, right? So you you can't, you just can't give up. It just it's just illogical, you know, not to be all Spock on you, but uh, so uh, one of the things that we've been doing, um, in addition to going through the DBT workbook, has been um, trying to find therapies that are kind of unusual and take them through some, um, you know, looking up scientific studies and, and see what the studies have to say about them, and then trying them. Um, we did color therapy last time, um, and we're going to do, uh, we're going to talk about journaling today, because there's some really strange and interesting studies out there about journaling um, to help with even, even not just anxiety, even disorders that are often accompanied by anxiety. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, in medical school, um, I learned that the human body releases various different neurotransmitters from very different parts. So I talk about histamine a lot, right? So histamine is released by your gut, um, causes increased acid release and things like that. It is also released by your immune system, causes things like allergies or helps to kill parasites. Um, and it's also released by your brain where it takes the form of anxiety. That's why one of the most useful anti-anxiety um, drugs um, is hydroxyzine, which is a antihistamine, right? So your whole body is very together and so there will be phenotypes where certain diseases are often accompanied by certain um, mental disorders as well. So people who have hypothyroidism often tend to have depression. People who have hyperthyroidism might have like anxiety. People who have um, rheumatoid arthritis or asthma a lot of times have anxiety, right? So these things that go together because maybe your lungs were the problem, but they're releasing chemicals that are affecting your brain. So how do you protect your brain? And also how can you prevent your brain from releasing chemicals that hurt your lungs, for example, in the case of asthma? And that's where something like journaling comes in, where we're hitting at the intersection between your brain and your body, right? Because you are not a separate person. That's why it's useful to have a primary care provider who's been trained in behavioral health stuff, because they can see the integration between all those. Rather than just a psychiatrist or just an internal medicine doctor, it would be ideal so psychiatrists are trained in physical body stuff, which is helpful. But sometimes those of us who are, like I'm a generalist, a lot of us don't remember or don't keep up our behavioral health studies, so we forget about the interplay between those things. It's called the biopsychosocial model of medical practice. If you know you're interested in those kind of terms and things, um, but that's what that is. And uh, let's uh, so all of that. Um, that's some kind of background before we get into the the kind of science of, of specifically of journaling. And we're gonna see about um, trying it for your depression, yeah, or your anxiety in your case. In my case, the depression. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, um, I am an actual doctor. My license number is in the description below, but our meeting here is secret, so there's no record of us having met in real life, and so um, everything here is just going to be for your self-care only. Not official medical advice. We got to keep it all secret. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about some studies? So I have this awesome book, which is, um, it's an integrative medicine textbook, but it's got, um, what I like about it is it's evidence-based. It focuses on studies and things like that. 
And one of the interesting, a um, couple interesting studies here, one of them, and this was a study, this was published in JAMA. Now, I don't know if I've talked with you, I think I have, I think in the last time we talked about how to evaluate if a study is legit, because a lot of times, especially reporters, I freaking hate reporters, and I used to be a reporter, so I'm allowed to say that. Um, but they will put, like, they will say a study says this and then not link to the study. Or they'll say um, a study says this and not really, it's not actually what it says because they haven't been trained in biostatistics. And they will cite studies or talk about studies or report on studies or be excited about studies that don't have um, necessarily like really good end values or stuff like that. It's just you have to be really careful about what you, what a study actually says, right? Um, you know, a study studies that are good will have very specific results, right? You're not going to have a study that says this cures cancer. The study is going to say, you know, this intervention in this population decreased this kind of cancer cell, right? It's going to be very, you know, specific to what actually happened. And um, one thing that helps you to see if a study is legit, of course, you don't want to always just trust the reputation of the journal, but the reputation of the journal does help because certain journals like JAMA um, have a very intensive review process where you have a lot of different reviewers um, who are also all physicians or biomedical um, scientists who like read through the article before it's published, the study before it's published and make arguments about it, corrections about it, things like that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's called a peer-reviewed journal, and JAMA is one of the best ones. It's the Journal of the American Medical Association. I dislike the American Medical Association for many reasons. I believe that they are responsible for the physician shortage in the United States. Um, however, the, you can't argue that JAMA isn't uh, pretty scientifically rigorous. So it's amazing that this study was published in there. This study is called The Effects of Writing About Stressful Experiences on Symptom Reduction in Patients with Asthma or Rheumatoid Arthritis. Uh, by Smith, S-M-Y-T-H-J-M, Stone, A-A, Hurwitz, A, and Kale, A. These are all doctors. Um, and that was published in 1999. So why isn't journaling like a widespread recommendation from PCM to their patients with asthma and rheumatoid arthritis? Well, it's a money issue. There aren't pen and paper companies going door to door at physician's offices. Who is it who's going from door to door at physician's offices? Yeah, as pharmaceutical salespeople, right? So, you know, and uh, it, it is what it is. But that's neat that that study was published. Um, so people who have anxiety, who have those conditions, journaling and writing about a stressful experience about 60 minutes a day, um, that, that can be helpful, right? So that's cool. Um, there's this other study, Klein K and Balls A, about expressive writing can increase um, working memory capacity. This was the Journal of Experimental Psychology. Um, the, they have a PubMed ID here. Um, it's the it's the Journal of Experimental Psychology General. Yeah, um, and I have the book also. I have the physical textbook here. That's the computer I tapped on the physical textbook. Um, and you can also put the put it in the I have it also on the computer. Um, so this study is fairly small. This one about expressive writing, increasing working memory capacity. It's only 35 people, okay? Um, so which that's another thing to look for in studies is like how big are they? But um, it still has some useful results. The results are discussed in terms of model grounded cognitive and social psychological therapy, which expressive writing reduces intrusive and avoidant thinking about a stressful experience, thus freeing WM resources. Basically, you put the stressful experience and everything down into the paper, and then you can think about other stuff like your studies. So it helps with your working memory. That's the theory behind that. Again, only 35 people, a small study. Okay. They did, um, they did one where writing about testing worries boosts exam performance in the classroom. Um, this was just straight up in the Journal of Science called, it's science, it's, you've seen it before. And this is a randomized control trial. Um, and they did two laboratory and two randomized field experiments. Their abstract sucks. It doesn't tell us how many students 
which is unfortunate. We expect that sitting for a important exam leads to worries about the situation's consequences that undermine text performance. We tested whether having students write down their thoughts about an upcoming test could improve test performance. The intervention of brief expressive writing assignment that occurred immediately before taking an important test significantly improved students' exam scores, especially for students habitually anxious about test taking. Simply writing about one's worries before a high stakes exam can boost test scores. That's cool, isn't it? But, um, so that was published in 2014 in the Journal of Science, but I hate that they didn't put their N or any of their really methods in their abstract. That's a really shitty abstract. Um, they have a full text link, though, to the Journal of Science, which is pretty cool. Um, nope. Nope. Can't see the full text link without buying. That's so crappy. I hate that. Poo poo to that. So maybe, so maybe it does. We don't know. We could, they could have tested it in only three people. We would have no idea. <laughs> um, that's I find that frustrating. Expression of stressful experiences through writing: effects of a self-regulation manipulation for pessimists and optimists. This is a study by Cameron L. D. and Nichols G. This is in the Journal of. The Division of Health Psychology, the American Psychological Association. So very, very legit journal, right? This is a clinical trial. They have 122. There we go. This is now we're getting somewhere. 122 students entering college who are classified as optimists or pessimists by using a dispositional optimism measure participated in a self-regulation task. Um, a disclosure and a disclosure task or a control task for three weekly writing sessions. Well, what is that? So a self-regulation task is when you express thoughts and feelings and then you formulate a coping plan. So that's one kind of writing you can do. You should break out your journal and just do things well during this time. Oh, you already have been. Oh, I didn't even hear the writing. It's good. It's smart of you to take notes. So um, they expressed, so they, you know, so that's one way you can do it is you can express your thoughts and feelings about the stress and then write down a coping plan. So that's called self-regulation. A disclosure text is where you just express thoughts and feelings and a control test is where you just write about whatever. That's what they used for their control. Among the optimists, both the self-regulation task and the disclosure task reduced illness-related clinic visits during the following month. Among pessimists, only the self-regulation task reduced clinical visits. In general, the self-regulation test beneficially affected mood state and college adjustment, whereas the disclosure test increased grade point averages. So that's neat, huh? So writing your stuff and working through it, actually working through it helps, and it helps more than just writing random, random crapola. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. So that helps people with stress, right? So that can help you with some of your anxieties and things. Um, IBS is another big anxiety disease. It's a disease. So in IBS, really what it is, is your gut is missing the same neurotransmitters that your brain is missing in depression. IBS is really a depressed gut. And your gut really needs neurotransmitters to work. Um, so in this one, they had 103 study subjects with irritable bowel syndrome. 82 in the writing group were asked to write at an online portal for 30 minutes and four consecutive days about their deepest thoughts, emotions, and beliefs regarding the disease and their perception of its effects. Compared with the non-writing control group, the expressive writing resulted in improved disease severity and fewer negative thoughts about their irritable bowel syndrome. So that's neat. So something where your neurotransmitters are messed up, obviously that's going to be helped by changing your brain as well. Now that particular study, that's study number 11, that's going to be Halpert A. Oh, that's the guy from the office. Um, Rybin D. and Doros G. This was the American Journal of Gastroenterology. Again, another legit journal. Like, this is no joke stuff. Um, expressive writing is a promising therapeutic modality for the management of IBS, a pilot study. Now, IBS is different than IBD. It's important that you understand that difference. IBD is things like Crohn's disease or... Um, ulcerative colitis, where your gut has an inflammatory process, not a neurotransmitter problem, and it could create these awful ulcers in your gut, and you have bloody poops. 
that's IBD that's different. IBS can only be diagnosed if you've ruled out everything else and your bowel just tends to do these awful rumbly things um, and it can be really painful as so, you know cramping pain and stuff like that um, and it can be helped with you know certain mental exercises so that's pretty cool. Um, oh this is an interesting one number 12 Stefan et al. reported that African-American subjects who had a higher level of perceived racism with the suppression of anger were also found to have higher blood pressure than subjects with lower levels of perceived racism. The first group also had higher blood pressure during sleep, a finding suggesting a baseline evaluation in sympathetic tone. So, but what does that have to do with journaling? I don't understand. Oh, I guess then they wrote out their problems about it. Number 12. Let's look at the study. Let's see. <laughs> oh, so the, the key here is anger inhibition. Anger inhibition did not account for the relationship between perceived racism and blood pressure. Anger inhibition was related to higher sleep diastolic blood pressure and a smaller drop in diastolic blood pressure from day to night. Perceived racism was positively correlated with anger inhibition but was not related to outwardly expressed anger. I have trouble understanding this study and exactly what it has to do with journaling. Perceived racism and anger inhibition are independently related to higher um, blood pressure both may contribute to the incidence of hypertension hypertensive related diseases observed in African Americans So writing it out Would help then because working through it would help to lower the blood pressure I see I see where the why they included this which seems totally unrelated in this In this so that's cool. You can help your blood pressure maybe too Which is also related to anxiety <laughs> journaling, journaling, journaling. Key areas of research, journaling for health, journaling after a stressful event. So, in an attempt to understand the pathophysiology behind the clinical effects of disclosure. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, some interesting studies here. I don't think we have time. We've spent a long time on studies. Um, so I want to give you some journaling activities to do. And we'll stop. But there is some really interesting ideas on, like, how disclosure affects your, um, your autonomic nervous system, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, skin conductance, things like that. Um, disclosing self-conscious events, things like that. Like, just getting, getting everything, you know getting things out there. There's a benefit to confession, as the Catholics have known for a long time. So, um, journaling for anxiety. Let me go back up to the anxiety chapter, and let's see. I think that there was a good section on anxiety. I'm sorry. I hope that this is okay. I really wanted to bring you stuff that's kind of useful this time, like really like some good science in it, and I hope that's not taking away from the personal attention aspect of it. Um, it's just really important to me to bring you like real stuff that's actually going to help you get better. Um, I just I feel like you don't, you know, you don't always get that. Do you know what the diagnostic criteria for anxiety are by the DSM five? Um, I, I have, oh no, I have the DSM-4 criteria here. Um, the DSM-5 basically is similar to the DSM-4. It has to be on a majority of days over the last six months, so more than half the time. Um, you have to have um, worrying about multiple things in life. It can't just be one. And then you have to have additional symptoms like easy fatigue ability, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, restlessness, sleep disturbance, things like that. Um, uh, patients often present with a physical complaint and don't recognize the stress-related origin, right? Um, so a lot of times you have things like sweating, headache, trembling, things like that. So, um, and a lot of people do have comorbid conditions, uh, which means you have other things going on as well. 
um, obviously you have to rule out organic disease because that's the thing is um, in in anxiety it could be that you have another problem not just anxiety so you got to get a full workup before we say oh this is just anxiety again this is why it's good to have a PCM who also has an understanding of mental illness so they've worked you up and made sure that your blood pressure is good made sure that your heart is good made sure um, your endocrine system is good you know your GI system is good you don't have IBS you don't want to just say you have anxiety and not check your IBS we want to check everything so if you have unusual symptoms, things like headaches and sweating and, um, you know, your your belly rumbling and things like that, make sure you get a full workup before they just settle on anxiety. Um, you know, make sure they, they check, you know, because you deserve that. Yeah. Well, it can even sometimes be something like PMS or menopause, right? You just got to give them all your symptoms so that they don't, um, they don't get stuck on just the mental part of it, right? That's important. Anemia also can look like anxiety, things like that. So, um, exercise is helpful for anxiety. That's true. You know that. You know that already. Um, some people have increased anxiety with caffeine, by the way. I am one of those people. Um, but, uh, there's different things you can try. We can go for some other time. Omega fatty acids folic acid, things like that. Um, but I'm trying to find the other journaling studies. Basically, journaling is helpful for things that are uh, related, right? Um, they recommend journaling here, taking a feeling inventory, enhancing self-awareness, but according to the studies we found, it actually looks like it's more helpful if you do journaling where you don't just do your own self-awareness, but you write out how to solve the problems that you have. You start figuring it out. Self-regulation, right? You come up with coping strategies for the things that are going on. So that's kind of neat. That's something that you can do. So. I think we found good stuff. I hope that helps you. I really do. Yeah. Well, I do want you to start feeling a little bit better. Um, so I think it would be good if what you do is, um, from here you start writing about the stressful events in your life. And then after you've written all the stressful events out, you write how they are affecting you. And after you've written out all how they're affecting you, you write out what you're going to do about it, right? That can be the hardest part, but that's a really good part to do. I think that you should do that. Are you gonna? I hope you just don't listen to me go to sleep. To go to sleep, I mean. I really, I want this to actually help you. I hope this was helpful. I feel discouraged in that I didn't find exactly the stuff that I was looking for. This list of studies is not as good as the list that I could probably come up with myself on PubMed. I am disappointed in this book. <laughs> but I'm not usually disappointed in the book. It's, it's okay. It is what it is. But I want you to feel like we've spent time together, but I also want you to have useful information, you know? Um, and I hope that this was useful and that I wasn't, you know, I don't know. What do you think about that sound? I hope it sounds good for you. Hey, you want to open some comics? I got these new comics from Moby's, which is a, um, it's a very small indie comic book company. I won them in a raffle. I can't believe they were so nice as to send them to me. Look at this cool thing. Let's open them. Oh, I don't want to break it. I could have Mango open them, but I'm afraid she would break the actual... I guess I can tear it above it. I'm not doing a good job. It's so terrible because you see all those like girls in, um, you know, people like gentle whispering in a lot of ASMR videos. And they do things all like perfect and they don't do this. 
and everything is like each movement is so measured and feminine and sticker, but I don't know how to get it off there. Look at this. This is the uh, company. It's Mobius. You should look them up. And this is Shadow World. Oh, I'm excited to look at this cute little comic. Volume 1 Bluebird. How neat is that? Look at that guy's face. I like the drawing. I like the like lines on the sternocleidomastoid and the neck and the chin. The sharp nose. That my husband has a similar, very defined nose. <laughs> That's cool. And now my pets some entertainment. Let us gaze upon the mortal. Look at the color scheme. I like this really muted color scheme. Look at that. That's really neat. Sucks, poor dude. Oh man. I hope he I hope he gets okay. They should leave this dude alone. Man, poor dude. Oh. And then they're making the monster go away from him. Wow, there's a lot of Viking horn people. Vikings didn't actually have horns, but you know, whatever. This isn't a Viking. Viking horn helmets are cool. People could have whatever they want. Wow, I love this unusual. It's so different art style. I mean, that's why indie comics are so cool. It's like very muted. It actually reminds me of like 80s, uh, 80s animation. I mean, look at that. Look at that, like, almost sketch-like style. That's really cool. Oh my gosh. And there's, like, not spelling errors and stuff like that. Sometimes indie comics are not very clean. And the writing isn't very well done, is what I mean. This is really neat. So you should check these guys out. Mobius.ws How neat. I'm so lucky. Look at that one. Look at that lady with her sword. She looks... B.A. Good for her. She's a pirate captain, I guess. Oh, I have a bunch of little stickers, too. Look what they sent me. Oh, my gosh. Look at these weird superheroes. Oh, cool. Oh, these are so awesome. Oh, my goodness. Look at those. Oh, I am so lucky to have these. I'm going to put them back in the envelope that I've destroyed. Maybe if I rip off the top of the envelope, I won't feel so bad for how bad I am at opening stuff. That's how we'll do it. Then it's not so awful. I don't know. I've never been, like, one of those super feminine women. And when I'm in uniform, people often mistake me for a dude. So, not that I've been in uniform for a while because of my health. I wonder who Dr. Fizz is. Hero fizzy all around nice guy. Doctor Fizz. What do you think? How neat. That's fun. Of 
course I'll let you borrow it if you want. But you should definitely get your own. Wait, did they send me one volume one and volume three? That's mean. That's really mean. Oh, no, but they're anthology series, so it finishes. Okay, I was gonna say, that's really, really, really mean. <laughs> Again, like, look at this cool muted art style. Like, that's so neat. This one is kind of more grays instead of blues. But very, very pretty. How neat. Oh my goodness. Oh, I really appreciate that. I have to send them a thank you note. I can't believe they were so nice. So they participated in the Superhero Mega Anthology. And, um, they were very giving and very generous and very ready to participate. Some people were not very, uh, some people just kind of wanted to receive. They wanted to receive subscribers, which is what we were getting for everybody. Got everybody 700 new, um, you know, email subscribers. And some people were kind of greedy and more, like, interested in getting than in helping the group out. And this was somebody who was interested in helping the group out, and they were rad, and they worked hard, and tried to make the anthology a success, so it's pretty cool, huh? I'll open the next one, maybe, in the next... You want to open this one next time? Yeah. Maybe we could even read through some of these together. I think what we'll do, we'd have to do some top-down... Yeah, where we can actually read them a little bit. Probably not read the whole thing, because I want you to. I don't want to like rip them off. I want you to go get them, but they're they're not they're not expensive. They're like I don't know two to five bucks for some really really nice comics. You should definitely check them out. I know they have digital versions. Yeah. Well, thank you for spending some time with me today. I hope this 